here can name for me any of the great philosophers in human history? Before you see it, give me a name. Anybody, yell it out. Oh, I had a policy in all my years of teaching at Notre Dame. You give a good answer, you get a Snickers bar. I heard Aristotle over there and Aristotle over here. Who else? Oh, now everybody's got an answer. Socrates, I hear. Who else? Oh, very good. Who else? Sun Tzu, Zeno, good grief. I've never heard that in a public place. Who else? Oh, good, good. I heard Nietzsche. I heard who else? Plato. Who else? You guys, I've never heard so many answers in my entire life. Uh, <laughs> wait. Uh, yeah, and one guy said my name. He gets the rest of the bag. Watch. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Nietzsche, Descartes. I think I even heard somebody say Heraclitus. I mean, what do these characters have in common? They're all dead. That's right. Doesn't look too good for me. <laughs> We're the great philosophers now. That's the question. We're the great thinkers of the present day. You know what I, you know what I think the answer might be? You might be sitting next to one. Oh, skeptical faces from lots of the tables all of a sudden. You guys, I'm not kidding. Ever since, oh, the turn of the century, the change of the millennium, 11 years ago, I've been seeing stuff I've never seen before. They didn't prepare me for this in my six years of graduate school at Yale, my 15 years of teaching at Notre Dame. Nobody said, hey, at the turn of the century, the change of the millennium all across America, in every walk of life, in every business, people are going to start turning into philosophers, asking deep and, and challenging questions about things they've long taken for granted. What is true success? How can I get more fulfillment in my work? Uh, how can I get more balance in my life? What, what's my legacy in this world supposed to be? It's not just the baby boomers hitting midlife crisis at the same time. It's people in their 80s, people in their 20s. I get emails every day from all over the world, people of every age. You remember the Olympics in Australia several years ago? The night before their opening ceremonies, I got a phone call. In a hotel room, I think I was in Chicago or someplace, and they didn't prepare me for this. Uh, the phone rings, I pick it up. Uh, Professor, you're live on Australian national radio in 20 seconds. And I'm thinking, what is this about? And, and the, the guy comes on and says, Professor Morris, why are all the biggest companies in America suddenly turning to you for advice? A philosopher. Why are all Americans becoming philosophers? I said, I'm really not sure. But Winston Churchill may have explained it when he said, you can always depend on Americans to do the right thing once they've exhausted every other possibility. <laughs> All right, we'll take it. Having tried everything else, people are turning to ancient wisdom. We're going to turn to some of my favorite of that wisdom in our short time this afternoon. We're going to talk about seven universal conditions for success. Now, i got to tell you, I, I was first asked to speak on this topic. I, I remember the day. It was 20 years ago. I was sitting in my office in Notre Dame doing what a philosopher does. I was thinking. Uh, <laughs> call from a big group of really successful people asking me would I come and speak to them on success. I thought, these are, these are really successful people who want me to speak to them about success. I mean, my wife will be really proud of me. I'll go home and tell her. Philosophers have no schedule whatsoever. So I jumped up from my desk. I grabbed my coat. I was on my way out the door. The phone rang again. I remember I jumped back, picked it up. By some cosmic coincidence, it was a publisher asking me would I consider writing a book on success, the very same thing. I ran to the Notre Dame football stadium where I parked my car. I drove two miles to get home. I, I parked my car. I ran into the house. I said to my wife, you won't believe it. Within 60 seconds, I just got these two phone calls. A big group of really successful people want me to speak to them on success. A publisher wants me to write a book on success. I thought she was going to glow with pride. You know, I thought I, she just looked real confused. She said, wait, don't you have to be a success before you can speak and write on it? I said, I'm not going to get hung up on a technicality. I'm a student to the wisest people who've ever lived, the folks y'all named. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Confucius, Lao Tzu. I'm going to go through the centuries across the cultures and ask a question. Is there a universal framework for success? And I'll tell y'all something. I read more books than I've ever read. Hundreds of books, thousands of essays. I was shocked to discover there are only seven utterly universal conditions for success. I brought everybody a little gift this morning. I put it on your, your table while you're at lunch. Um, a laminated wallet card. On one side of the card are these seven conditions for success that are going to structure our time together this afternoon. The first one comes to us from Aristotle. Aristotle used archery terminology. The Greek word was telos. It meant bullseye. Aristotle said in anything we do, any challenge we have, any opportunity we face, we need first and foremost a clear conception of what we want. We need a vivid vision, a goal, 
clearly imagined. Aristotle understood in times of change how confusing things can be, how difficult it can be to focus our thinking. And, you know, you remember the, um, the actress Lily Tomlin, who was really popular years ago? She said not too long ago, I always wanted to be somebody. I should have been more specific. I love that. Uh, my kids are in their 20s, and a lot of their friends are that way. I want to be somebody. I want to do something. What? They have no clue. Vague thoughts cannot motivate specific behavior. One of my favorite first century uh, philosophers, Seneca, a Roman, said uh, once, no wind blows fair for a ship that has no port. I've always loved that. Think about that for a second. No wind blows fair for a ship that has no port. If we don't know where we're going, we can't take advantage of the things that cross our paths along the way. So Seneca, following Aristotle, said, set clear goals at every stage of your adventure, in every dimension of your life. And don't just let them be intellectual. Make them a vision. The book of Proverbs says, without a vision, people perish. Uh, Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. One of the biggest mistakes in the business world today is that we set our goals with the intellect but not with the imagination. We've got to root our goals in the fertile soil of the imagination to really draw on the deepest powers we have. I want to say something more about that in just a minute, but first I want to comment on this because a couple of us were talking during lunch about great uh, writers on, on topics of success and leadership. A lot of motivational speakers for about 100 years now have been saying how important it is for us to set goals, almost as if it doesn't matter what our goals are, as long as we have some. The philosophers thought it mattered deeply what our goals are, so I decided to bring you all today the greatest piece of advice ever given for powerful goal setting. It was first said by Thales, then by Socrates, then by Plato, then by Aristotle. It was so important, it was inscribed in marble on the holiest spot in ancient Greece, the oracle at Delphi. The Greek philosophers said, it doesn't matter what you face. It doesn't matter what you hope for. It doesn't it matter what the challenge is that may confront you right now. Job one is always the same. Know thyself. Know thyself. Self-knowledge is the source for powerful goal setting. So many, you wouldn't believe how many presidents of companies come to me on a regular basis saying something like, Tom, I don't know what's going on. We're reading the best practices literature, books like Built to Last and Good to Great and In Search of Excellence and The Discipline of Market Leaders and Execution. And they go through all these titles and say, we, we, we transplanted some of those ideas into our company and they didn't work. They transplanted, they didn't translate. They didn't filter through the grid of self-knowledge. Who are we? What is our strength? What is our position? Sometimes, you know, uh, great business books report on what's widely done. Sometimes the most powerful thing you can do is not what's widely done by others, by your competitors, for example, but what's right for you. What can make you distinctive? What can make you different? And you're not going to know that unless you know yourself on an individual level, on an organizational level. Individual level, what do I love? What do I not like so much? What, what are my talents? What can I bring to this position? How can I take some initiative now? There's nothing more powerful than a team of people, all of whom are taking initiative based on their own understanding and knowledge and talents. It's incredible. Every exercise in goal setting should be an exercise in self-knowledge. Well, I decided if I brought you all that, I'd go ahead and bring you the second most... The second greatest piece of advice for powerful goal setting, but the second most important probably, but, but maybe more important now than it was in the ancient world. Not as widely understood as the importance of knowing yourself, but in times of change, I, I, I know uh, Charlie talked a little bit this uh, morning about you know, using the image of a, of a mountain. The, um, the philosopher said, do not allow what is very good to keep you from what is best. And the best illustration of what they had in mind is exactly that. Uh, the hills of Georgia here. I mean, imagine you're out in the woods on a hike, and let's say you've set it as your goal to get the highest point in the area. And so you and the group are going to get to the highest point in the area. You're the leader. From where you stand, Hill A is the highest point you can see, whether it's fog, whether it's perspective, whatever. You climb Hill A. You slip and you fall and you struggle, and finally you get up to the summit from which vantage point you can now see for the first time the much higher He'll be. Now, let me ask y'all a question. When, uh, what's the first thing you're going to have to do? Let's say you stand and perched atop Hill A. What's the first thing you're going to have to do to get to Hill B? Anybody? Go down. Go downhill. 
And when you as leaders suggest this, what's everybody going to say? This is almost universal. What do you, what do you mean we got to go downhill? It took us a long time to get up here. This is very good. We can see a lot from Hill A. There's so many businesses, so many companies, so many divisions of businesses, so many families, so many individuals stuck on top of Hill A because nobody wants to go downhill. What does that metaphorically represent? Changing what you've most recently been doing, getting outside your comfort zone, adjusting to new realities that might be a little awkward feeling, that might be a little uncertain. That, but you know, and as you go down Hill A, look at this, this is kind of interesting too. If your goal is to get to the highest point in the area, and you're going down from Hill A, it looks like initially that you're going in the opposite direction from your true goal, right? You're getting lower in order to get higher. A hospital president once told me they switched computer systems. He said, I've never heard people complain so much in my whole life. And he said, I had to keep saying, look, we're going to have a downhill period for about six weeks, and you're going to be learning a lot of new stuff. A lot of stuff's going to be uncomfortable, but you're going to have power to do stuff you've never even dreamed of doing before. And he said a month or two later, people were coming to him and saying, Man, you were right. We just had to hang in there during that discomfort phase. of Wow, this is just, we did the right thing in making this changeover. People want to stay on Hill A. Tom Peters did a study of why, why very successful companies, namely the ones he profiled in his book, his famous book, In Search of Excellence, why companies fail. Great, why great companies fail. And basically, he didn't put it like this, but his, his, his answer, once he did a ton of research, was everybody's stuck on Hill A and nobody wants to go downhill. Basically, we get comfortable with the first great success we've had. Don't let what's very good keep you from what is best. Be bold. Set new goals. One of the biggest mistakes on the part of highly successful people is that they stop setting stretch goals. 